Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. This is a big episode. So lots of stuff in here. We have some Threadripper leaks to GN through an exclusive source, and these are actually pretty interesting ones. Uh, Intel and its marketing need work. USB 4.0 specifications are actually published now, and then discussion from uh, AMD on BIOS updates to fix clock boosting problems, among other things. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake C360 DDC Hard Tubing Water Cooling Kit. If you're ready to dip your toes into the water and build your first open loop cooling system, the Thermaltake C360 DDC hard tubing kit comes with all of the components you need. The kit includes a 360 millimeter radiator, three 120 ARGB fans, a copper W4 ARGB water block for the CPU, a pump and res DDC combo, and all the fittings needed to build a full CPU open loop. Learn more at the link in the description below. First off, Threadripper leaks to GN. We received information from a source in the industry that uh, actually it was a, an official AMD internal document that we received from said source. And it points toward information for the new Threadripper CPU. So Threadripper 3 for the CPU. And these names are a bit funny, but we received documentation though on it. And basically what we've learned is that there's going to be a split. So there's a workstation and an HEDT Threadripper line of CPUs. There's a schism between them. and the core count and thread count in these documents were not revealed. The documents are intended for people like motherboard manufacturers to decide uh, their thermal design, thermal solutions for motherboards, things like that. So it's information you would need for heat sink design, for example. And what this did say, though, without core thread count was a couple of other things. So it did claim 512 kilobytes of L2 cache per core, if this ends up being uh, accurate documentation. There was omitted L3 cache information. It said four channels, DDR4, for one of the versions, which is uh, going to be called the STRX4 unit. And then the other one, the SWRX8, will have eight channels. That's the workstation unit. The other one's HEDT, typical Threadripper you're used to. And these document notes that STRX4 and SWRX8 are single socket solutions, uh, client platforms that use surface mount LGA sockets and they support the family 17H models 30 through uh, FH, or 30H through 3FH, and that's just hex codes for the different CPUs. So uh, this seems to include previous generation CPUs, but we're not 100% positive on that right now. The document also includes a note that STRX4 should include 64 lanes of PCIe Gen 4, with 16 of those being switchable to SATA, if you want to do that as, as the motherboard maker. And then the other one, SWRX8, is supposed to have 96 to 128 lanes, so it might be variable based on the processor of Gen 4, and that allows for 32 switchable lanes to SATA if desired. As for overclocking support, STRX4 is marked as yes, and SWRX8 is marked as no for overclocking. Uh, it does seem that SWRX8 is basically a, a budget version of Epic or a poor man's Epic, if you will. So the document also notes thermal design requirements. It, it's, there's a lot of information here. I'm not going to go through all of it today. But what we wanted to report on first was that it states that the CPUs will have two infrastructure groups. There's group A and there's group B. Group A is for the HEDT processors. And that assumes a 32 degree Celsius ambient temperature uh, in determining the thermal solution. Group B is for workstation processors. And that assumes a uh, a higher ambient temperature of 42 degrees Celsius. Group A has a TDP presently noted as 280 watts, whereas uh, it, Group B does as well, whereas T case is marked as 60 degrees Celsius maximum for Group A and a uh, T control maximum of 100 degrees Celsius. And then there's some information on SWRX8 as well. We'll put that chart on the screen or something. Uh, so we also receive voltage requirements, other information on this. But we need we require more time to crawl through the rest of the documentation. It's fairly extensive, and see if we can piece together uh, the more interesting or useful information before launch. We'll put that in the next news video. But this will get you started. Separately, if you are curious about release dates, we don't have that information uh, directly from anybody. Hardware Info did though add a patch note that said TR3000 support. A preliminary support has been added, so obviously they're ramping up for it on the software side. Intel recently re-embarked on its realistic workload benchmarks at IFA or IFA. So Intel's marketing needs work is the name of this segment. Uh, Intel called out AMD for leaning so heavily on Cinebench and its testing. 
we do agree that Andy does too much Cinebench, and that's not the best place to be. But Intel's approach to this isn't really much better. So roughly in the July time frame previously, Intel noted that its Core i9 processors will perform better in, quote, Windows desktop applications, and that uh, web performance is also better on Intel, whatever that, that means, and uh, also AAA PC gaming. Uh, more recently, the IFA discussion, as in like in the past uh, week, that talks about notebooks and uses two-in-one utilization of rendering applications as an indicator of the relevance of said applications. It ends up downplaying the importance of rendering applications. So a few things here. First of all, we agree and we have shown in our CPU reviews, 3900X review, whatever, that Intel performs better in gaming applications when strictly comparing SKU to SKU, although value proposition is not eternally in Intel's favor, it kind of varies. Intel, we think, has forfeited the i5 segment to R5s, although the 9600K is technically a leader in raw FPS. The gap is small enough and the deficit elsewhere is large enough that we no longer recommend i5 CPUs and instead point toward R5 3600 CPUs. That stated, Intel's 9700K is better positioned against the 3700K in gaming while having comparable price, and the 9900K obviously is still the chart leader in raw gaming performance, albeit it is expensive. Now, if you're someone who says, I only play games, I want high refresh rate, I want to buy the highest end GPU possible, what should I buy? And, and, and also I have a budget that doesn't really matter too much which CPU I buy, then yeah, we'll say 9900K is the chart topper for that use case. But uh, once you start looking outside of that use case, it gets really difficult, especially for things like production tasks, for Intel to continue to prove its value. Uh, in the R5 and i5 segment, AMD is the clear choice. The R5 3600 is extremely good. So let's go over this a bit. For one, Intel is downplaying production performance overall where AMD does well. This should surprise nobody. AMD does the same thing with regard to Intel's gaming performance. Basically says, why do you need that many frames? Who cares? It's good enough. We're within X percent. So they both do this to each other. But Intel does this primarily by beating the same dead horse. That Cinebench isn't representative of all use. And we agree that it's not. However, there's an important point here. Uh, Cinebench although we do not use it for reviews and we don't really like it for a lot of reasons, uh, Cinebench is not that different from what you might, what Intel might call real applications. Blender is a pretty damn real application. It's a rendering application. Cinebench is representative of Cinema 4D, which is used by people. Blender is uh, a growing, pretty wide use, user base, and we use it internally for our own rendering. So we're really comfortable with using it for benchmarking because we know exactly what's needed and we render our own scenes that we've built. So it's like real use cases and it's pretty hard to argue in that scenario that is not representative of real use because it's literally real use. Like we, we actually used Blender to do those, like the intro animation for the videos. So Cinebench isn't that different from Blender in that regard. They're both rendering applications. So while Intel is downplaying Cinebench, it is... Uh, by collateral, also downplaying other tile-based rendering applications. And that is a bad thing to do because they are very popular, even if not everybody uses them. Uh, like, I don't know, say for example, Photoshop's pretty widespread, Premiere's pretty widespread. Rendering applications like uh, Cycles Renderer, in, I should be saying 3D applications like Blender, not rendering applications, but uh, 3D applications are very widespread, of course, especially you look at the games and the um, movie industries. So all of that's dead. It's AMD still winning in Blender. So while Intel can downplay Cinebench, AMD's still winning in real uh, applications using the, the, the real terminology that Intel uses, like Blender. Uh, and it's not that dissimilar. So that said, AMD does well with Cinebench for a few reasons. One of them is it can fit everything in cache that it needs for the render. Uh, and so it doesn't really need to reach outside to grab any data. This benefits AMD, but tile-based rendering is also used elsewhere. And if you start looking at applications like Cinebench versus Blender, the kind of irony, amusing irony here, is that while Intel is saying Cinebench is bad, or perhaps not that exact phrasing if they I'm sure, I'm sure if I get contacted by Intel, they'll say, we didn't say it's bad. 
Uh, Intel is saying it is not realistic. Let's go with that. While Intel is saying it's not realistic, the, the I, I think amusing part is Intel will relatively do better in Cinebench than it will in other 3D rendering applications because Cinebench, by the bench indicator in the name, is meant to be a benchmark and it is therefore pretty short and pretty easy to run. And because it's short, Intel, with its turbo boosting duration limits enabled properly on motherboards, Intel will do better in Cinebench because if you run it once, especially R15, you run it once, you don't run it in rapid succession, what you end up with is the CPU's boost higher to hit that maximum uh, power state that it's allowed to meet for however many seconds, 100 seconds, whatever it is, 20 seconds for the first one, 100 for the second one, something like that, depending on the board a bit. Intel will reach that boost for the duration of the Cinebench benchmark and therefore look relatively better versus AMD when compared to something like Blender where you might be rendering for the period of time determined by the benchmarker. And in our case, because we're using a real slide that we made, a real frame from an animation, it takes about 30 minutes on a mid-range CPU, maybe 10 on a really high-end CPU. So no matter what, you're well beyond that turbo boost duration limit and therefore Intel will exit the turbo for all, for uh, that period after the period's expired, it exits it, clocks down, runs at the 90-ish watt load for the rest of the benchmark, and will look relatively worse versus AMD. So Intel could actually, I mean, like, you, you're not winning in either of them, but relatively it should actually look better in Cinebench on average. Anyway, uh, all of that stated, the 3900X also does better in our Premier benchmarks than the comparable Intel CPUs, which actually surprised us initially. It didn't used to be that way. So this is a massive blow to a segment where Intel was previously advantaged. Intel still has a very strong advantage in Photoshop, to be fair, but that's the only one really where we're seeing frequency so heavily benefited out of the benchmark suite we run. Uh, so a friend of the site, Rob Williams of TechGage.com, recently wrote an article talking about this more about Intel's new marketing, and he called out how Intel has begun contradicting its previous marketing, which uh, he is absolutely accurate on. So previously, Intel worked with Maxon and worked on Cinebench, used Cinebench to demonstrate its performance with 18 core processors, for example. And now that AMD is using the same trick against Intel, Intel has decided that the previous marketing is no longer useful. So that's the story on that. Uh, some, some bits of irony in there, but mostly just stupid big companies fighting each other. I think Roman actually said it the best. Roman, aka Dirt Bauer on YouTube. I believe his phrase was that when you put the two slides next to each other, Intel and AMD slides next to each other, it's one high school 15-year-old girl fighting another high school 15-year-old girl. And that was how he perceived the battle between the two. I would say, Roman, as usual, your German precision is dead on. Uh, USB 4 specifications published. So USB Implementers Forum, or USB IF, has officially announced the new USB 4 specification. And note that there is a, a difference in the spacing between where the 4 goes versus USB, because USB group wants to continually change the name so that uh, no one understands anything. But USB 4, with that space no longer between USB and the number, critical change. Uh, USB 4 offers twice the bandwidth of USB 3.2. It's a theoretical 40 gigabits per second of throughput. And that's assuming the use of the certified cables, mind you. USB IF announced the USB 4 earlier this year, as well as revealing some confusing new branding for the existing generations of USB. In addition to the increased bandwidth, USB 4 will be backwards compatible with previous USB specifications, just like the last ones have been. There's also a universal Thunderbolt 3 compatibility, and Intel offered up the Thunderbolt 3 spec to the USB IF meaning that any vendor wanting to offer a Thunderbolt 3 compatible device no longer needs to license to use the technology. Uh, however, the catch is that Thunderbolt 3 isn't technically required for USB 4, and so implementation is optional. Additionally, any device that is Thunderbolt 3 compatible will, no, will need to undergo validation, which is not free, and uh, it remains to be seen how well adopted Thunderbolt 3 will become, obviously. A USB 4 will also allow or offer better allocation between data and video bandwidth, and it will retain the Type-C connector. However, USB IF will announce new specifications for the Type-C connector in the future to handle new USB uh, 4 interface, uh, power and data delivery, stuff like that. All right, next up, speaking of Dare Bauer earlier, Dare Bauer survey in the wake of Ryzen 3000 issues with reaching the advertised boost clocks, Dare Bauer, 
commissioned a survey uh, among the user base to assess how pervasive the issue was. The results were seemingly worse than expected. And this all came about because uh, in speaking with Roman at LTX earlier in person, a couple, maybe two months ago, uh, this came about because when we were all testing Ryzen 3000 behind the scenes before embargo lift, Roman and I were talking, we were seeing boost issues. Uh, we published probably like a week's worth of content on frequency issues with Ryzen 3000. Roman was having issues with it as well that were different than ours. And AMD talking to Roman was more or less saying no one else has seen this. And uh, us talking to AMD at the same time without AMD having the knowledge of, these, of this like triangle existing, uh, we were saying, hey, we're having frequency issues. So Roman was getting word that uh, no, no one else is. You're doing it wrong, or at least the implication thereof. And that wasn't true. So he, uh, in deciding to be absolute and determine how bad the issue is, collected something like 3,000 results. And we recommend watching his video. It's on Dare Bauer on YouTube, uh, the channel. We'll link it in the, our show notes below, though. So there's been an abundance of confusion to recap this over Ryzen 3000's boost clock behavior, enough to warrant AMD to tail back and uh, update its Ryzen product pages, something we talked about last week, confirming that only one core is awarded the highest boost clock. This should surprise no one, but it's deeper than that, and AMD didn't really go much deeper than that in its product updates. So still, many users haven't achieved the specified boost frequencies on any of the cores at all. This is something we showed in our initial reviews for the 3900X, certainly, and some of the others. 3600, we actually were reaching the boost uh, spec on, but that was the only one. Their Bauer survey shows that we weren't alone and being uh, having difficulty reaching these specs. And he polled 2,700 participants who ran the single-threaded benchmark on Cinebench R15. The maximum clock speed was recorded with hardware info for that. And these R5 3600 seemed to fare the best, matching our own data that we saw. Uh, same thing, and it had roughly half the users reporting boost clocks as advertised. Faring worse, however, was the R9 3900X, with only 5.6% of users seeing the correct maximum boost clocks, and it seems many boost clocks were anywhere between 25 to 100 megahertz shy of the correct clock speeds, and some were further off than that. So we're only going to show uh, a little bit of his, like maybe one of his charts in the video. He has a lot of data. Please go watch it. It's well worth it. He's done a lot of work on it and deserves uh, the viewership. So uh, again, that'll be linked below if you want to see it. Andy pushing BIOS updates to fix boost clock problems. This is certainly completely unrelated to the previous news topic and has nothing to do with it or what Roman's done. Uh, so with the aforementioned news, this leads to Andy's official response that Ryzen 3000 boost clock issues are being addressed. Probably Andy's been looking at this for a little while, but the recent public pressure from media hasn't made it easy. So Andy took to Twitter to both acknowledge and update the community regarding the problem, uh, Twitter, of course, being the official source of news for anything, and said, quote, Andy is pleased with the strong momentum of third-gen AMD Ryzen processors and the PC enthusiasts and gaming communities. We closely monitor feedback on our products and understand that some third-gen Ryzen users are reporting <laughs> some are reporting boost clock speeds below the expected processor frequency. While processor boost frequency is dependent on many variables, including workload system design and cooling solution, we have closely reviewed the feedback from our customers and have identified an issue in our firmware that reduces the boost frequencies in some situations. Continuing the quote saying, we are in the process of preparing a BIOS update for our motherboard partners that addresses that issue and includes additional boost performance optimizations. We'll provide an update on September 10th to the community regarding availability of the BIOS. We've already, GN's already been in contact with motherboard manufacturers. We have uh, the early versions of that firmware coming in as soon as they arrive. And a couple things here. This is a very PRE statement in that AMD is doing the usual PR thing of saying, starting off by saying, everything's amazing. Thank you for the extremely strong momentum. Um, there's a small problem. A few people, about 95%, aren't reaching the advertised boost clock. So for those few people with the 3900X, 95% uh, of you, we will fix that problem. So anyway, we'll test it as soon as we get it. AMD Renoir APUs to come with improved memory support. This is a quick one. A pair of Linux patches have ostensibly confirmed that AMD's upcoming Renoir APUs will come equipped with an improved memory controller supporting LPDDR4X 4266 memory. This would be a welcome upgrade over the Raven Ridge and Picasso processors, and uh, both of those support DDR4 2400 in an official capacity. Renoir looks to be AMD's first chip supporting LPDDR4X memory, and we could make the argument that AMD needed to introduce broader memory support to uh, these types of products to 
compete with Intel's forthcoming Ice Lake mobile chips, which support DDR4 3200, LP DDR4 3733, for example, and will feature improved Gen 11 graphics. The higher memory specification should theoretically benefit AMD in a big way because with APUs, you don't have onboard memory with like a mother or a video card rather. So because you don't have a GPU that can just talk to its own dedicated memory that's faster and physically very close, having faster system memory benefits APUs a lot because they do, uh, they do lean on those. And then a couple quick ones here. So uh, 9900KS and Cascade Lake X shipping in October. As mentioned previously, October could be a crowded month for CPUs, high-performance CPUs. AMD's got its new stuff coming out in uh, September, in theory. And for Intel, Ryan Trout, previously a PC perspective, took to the stage at Intel's EFA presentation, the same one discussed a second ago, to announce that October ship date for the Cascade Lake X HEDT parts and the binned 9900KS CPUs is, is coming up fast. Uh, so Shrout was scarce with details, but noted that the 9900KS will come with a 5 gigahertz boost clock across all cores. We talked about this previously probably around Computex. Um, that's not too distant from what it does already, but if it's binned, then the real hope, we hope, is that we can get it in a stream, do some LN2, and push it higher. And actually, speaking of LN2, Backtracking a second to AMD's statement where they said that uh, boost clocks depend on thermal solution. Uh, I should note that we didn't reach the maximum advertised boost until we hit minus 80 degrees Celsius. So um, if you are, if if your thermal solution, you know, is anywhere north of that, then I guess you need a new one. Anyway, back to Intel. Uh, AMD and its Ryzen 3000 chips were pointed at in the Intel presentation for the same issues discussed earlier. Shroud also noted that the increased pressure AMD has placed on uh, Intel is noted and said, quote, the point is we're not taking this sitting down. We see the competition and we see the landscape as it is. We're adjusting because we take these customers very seriously and we want to give them the best products possible, which is actually kind of a big thing from Intel, which has historically uh, more or less ignored that AMD has existed. Intel's a big enough company that it can take the approach of just doing what it does. And when you say, what about those new AMD FX processors? They say the new, huh? <laughs> what is that? Uh, Asus and Acer gaming laptops with 300 hertz displays coming out and uh, defending why you need 300 hertz displays. They didn't share any configuration details, or at least Acer didn't, but we can assume Acer will ship the Triton 500 with an RTX 2080 as well, like the Asus one. Uh, we can speculate that both companies are sourcing the panel from the same place. Asus is expected to ship the ROG Zephyrus SGX701 in October, priced TBA, with Acer pegging a December launch for its Triton 500 priced at $2,800 if you're interested in 300 hertz displays on a laptop. And then August Steam Hardware Survey, last one. Valve released its Steam Hardware Survey for August. And the biggest highlight is the trend of AMD increasing its CPU share among survey participants, a trend that's been ongoing since July. AMD now accounts for 19% of CPU share among Steam users who participated in the survey, while Intel has dropped to 81%. The GTX 1060, 1050 Ti, and 1050 are still the most popular GPUs by way of the survey, albeit their grasp is slipping. Meanwhile, the RTX series continues to make steady progress, and NVIDIA's super refresh has likely contributed here. The RTX 2070 is still the most popular RTX model among Steam users, and is up 0.19% over the last month. The RTX 2060 comes in as a close second, up 0.24% over the last month. And the RX 580 is Andy's most popular card currently, still seeing growth with a 0.07% increase in share over last month. That's it for the news video. As said, this was a, a pretty packed one. If you want to help us out directly with this type of stuff, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our shirts, one of our mod mats, toolkits, or something else. And you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.